Well, today is uh, Passion Sunday. Be back here again in Kentucky. And the epistle for this Passion Sunday is taken from St. Paul's out of the Hebrews, chapter 9. Brethren, when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered once for all through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands, that is, not by of this creation nor again by virtue of the blood of goats and calves, but by virtue of his own blood, into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkled chashes of, an effer, of a heifer sanctified the unclean unto the, uncle, unto the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the Holy Ghost offered himself unblemished unto God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, this is why he is mediator of a new covenant, that whereas a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the former covenant, they who have been called may receive eternal inheritance according to the promise in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in the Gospel, taking that according to St. John chapter 8. At that time Jesus said to the crowds of the, of the Jews, Which of you will convict me of sin? If I speak to you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear is that you are not of God. The Jews therefore in answer said to him, Are we not right in the saying that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and who judges. And many men, I say to you, if anyone keep my word, he will never see death. And the Jews therefore said, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If anyone keep my word, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom dost thou make thyself? <clears throat> Jesus answered, If I glory my, glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me of whom you say that he is your God. And you do not know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be like unto you, a liar. But I know him, and I keep his word. Abraham your father rejoiced that he was to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say unto you, Before Abraham came to be, I am. They therefore took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out from the temple. Thus far the words of the day's holy gospel. <coughs> the Father and the Son of the Ghost, Amen. We enter now to the great battle of Passion Tide, the final battle of our Lord Jesus Christ is going to go to the cross, and the church is going to the cross. So at the Mass today, like the Requiem Mass, we drop out the Yudikame. We don't say those words, the joy, I'll go to the altar of God, for the God who gives joy to my youth. We drop those words out. Because now it is not the time of youth. It's not the time of joy. It is a time of an adult fighting a battle. And our Lord Jesus Christ is now an adult he is going to fight a battle. I remember he will not lose his childhood. Remember Saint, our Lord did say that if you unless you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But it's talking about what he does. When it's time to fight, we fight like a man. We don't fight like children. We don't fight like women. We fight like men. By the way, St. Paul says that when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I played with the things of a child. But when I was, became a man, I put away the things of a child. While we must always be as little children, there is a time when we must be as a man. This is the time of battle. And therefore, we drop out of the Mass from this day all the way until Easter, the Yudikame. We drop it out. In memory of this time of Christ being the most perfect of all men. Men is in a male of the species. The one that woman is not equal to, contrary to the statement of Bishop Filet in his interview with In Conflict Zone, where he says he thoroughly agrees that woman is perfectly equal to man, only he does not agree with Jesus Christ, does not agree with the Catholic Church. 
do not agree with truth, do not agree with St. Thomas Aquinas. Man is not the same as woman. And this is the time of men. And this is the time of battle. And the Lord Jesus Christ has entered a great battle. And it is a great battle on both sides. Because in this battle, it is the final battle. The battle between Jesus Christ, man, and Jesus Christ, God. And the battle between Satan, who has tried to make a new religion <clears throat> that is spoken of by St. Augustine when he says, two loves built two cities, and the one of them is called the city of the love of man, the worship of man, the other, the worship of God. Real men worship God. Any man that worships man will become effeminate. Any man that worships man will lose his manhood. But nonetheless, he is going to be a worshiper of man. And it is, not, it is also a lie, because whoever says he worships man actually worships the devil. He actually is a servant of Satan. And we are in the final battle, in which the members of the Church of Christ, it is a very important warning <coughs> that's found in the Gospel today. And Jesus hid himself and went out from the temple. Which temple did he go out from? It was a temple that was designed by God First, the tabernacle was designed by God himself, given the plans to Moses. Then God commanded Solomon to build the temple. It was then destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then God commanded Esdras to rebuild the temple and made it more glorious than the temple was originally when it was built by Solomon. And it is said in the great prophecies of the Old Testament that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, he will preach the truth in this temple. There will be real priests in this temple, true priests of God. They will offer the true sacrifice. They will teach the true faith, the true faith of the Old Testament. And it is in this temple, during the time of the Old Testament, that Christ hides himself and goes out. The veil has not yet been ripped from top to bottom. The Old Testament will come to an end at 3 p.m. on Good Friday. This is before 3 p.m. on Good Friday. It is still the true testament, and Christ hides himself and goes out of the temple. And this is a warning to us. For everything that happens in the sacred scripture shall happen again at the end of times. All the truths of the Old Testament shall be repeated in the New Testament. And here it becomes clear that it is very possible for Christ to hide himself and go out from the church. He can hide himself and go out. And this is what he did in Vatican II. He hid himself and went out from the temple. And they used the power of their priesthood. And they used the power of their episcopacy. And the Pope used the power of his papacy in order to crucify Christ. And that's what happened. And so it is the final battle. The worship of man versus the worship of God. And there are the techniques, the style. St. Ambrose tells us how the battle happens. And one thing that he pointed out, he says, you know that if you look at the year 30 AD, we have Caiaphas, we have Herod, we have Pilate, we have all the same wicked leaders who were there the same wicked leaders that were there at the year 30 A.D. are the same wicked leaders there at the year 33 A.D. The same wicked leaders, the same ones. These same leaders, they are the ones that are ready to crucify Christ at the very beginning. They're ready to crucify Christ at the beginning. They will remain ready to crucify him until the end. So the wicked leaders are ready to crucify him. But why then is Christ not crucified? And he says the reason is because the crowd, the multitudes of the Jews, whom Christ speaks to today. Now remember previous to today, he's speaking to the Pharisees when he says wicked things. You brood of vipers. He says, but today in the gospel, in the great battle of John chapter 8, he says to the multitude of the Jews, and not just the Pharisees, not just the scribes, not just the leaders, but now after three years, the multitudes have changed. And this is what St. Ambrose speaks about in one of his commentaries. He says that, notice that while the leaders were ready to crucify Christ, he could not be crucified. And he tells us that in the gospel, that they did not lay hands on him for fear of the they did not lay hands on him. The crowd had to be prepared, and it was prepared over three years. We can see this same preparation happen in the Catholic Church over the last 400 years. 
We see the same preparation happen in the society of St. Pius X over the last 40 years. And now, in the last four years, the same preparation takes place within the resistance. 10% of the time was needed of 400 years to break down the mainstream of the Catholic Church. 40 years to break down the mainstream of the Society of St. Pius X. And four years to break down our little resistance, trying to hold the truth. But there is a technique. What must be done, says St. Ambrose? The crowd must be changed. And he says in his sermon on it, he says, we all meet Christ in the crowd. But in the end, we must decide, are we going to leave the crowd and join the mob? Or are we going to join, leave the crowd and join the elect? No one stays in the crowd. The crowd is neither good nor bad. It's just a bunch of people in the marketplace. It's a bunch of people in the city. And in this state, they meet Christ. And some leave the crowd to go to the elect and follow Christ. The majority leave the crowd to become a part of the mob. The mob that will say, let him be crucified. And the mob that will say, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. The mob was prepared. Now let's consider the preparation of the mob. Because this is what's happened in the last four years. The preparation of the mob. The first stage in the corruption of the truth. You can never attack the truth directly, immediately, because you will fail. Remember, the devil operates in darkness. The devil operates in smoke. Christ operates in light and in clarity. But the devil operates in darkness and smoke. And so what is the technique? The first technique is to pretend like you're a friend of those that are the friends of Christ. This is the first step to feign friendship. It's the rule of the communists. The Blessed Virgin Mary said, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world. There's a Russian communist way of operating. This communist way is being done within the society of St. now within our resistance. Being done in the mainstream church and throughout all the countries in the world. The same technique. Stage one. As the evil men are trying to destroy the church, evil men are trying to destroy the good organization or the good group. Some of the evil men enter that group. And what do they do? They become friends. And they feign friendship in order that they might build up trust, the first stage. When they build up trust, they then they give advice. And the advice sounds like they're your friend. But in fact, when you listen carefully, you discover they never actually told you to fight the devil. They never actually agreed with the truth. They simply gave the impression that you should fight the devil and gave the impression you should agree with the truth, but they never actually said it. And at any opportunity they had to weaken, they weakened by their advice. The second step, turn a deaf ear to those in need. The second step is to turn a deaf ear. This has happened, for instance, in the last four years. We find now, after four years of the resistance, we are now in a stage of a big split. How did this happen? The first stage, the feigned friendship. The second stage, the deafness. The principal one that has been doing this, Bishop Williamson. In the third, second stage, when we ask for help, please give us another bishop. Please help us. Please lead the way. Please preach the food. truth. Please be a strong beacon following our Swiss Lefebvre. We are looking to follow you. We are looking to stand by you. But he says, no, I cannot do this. And they ask, people call for help, and the help is not given. The third stage. The third stage is a very important stage. This is the stage of gossip. The stage of backbiting. The stage of working in the back. The stage of going from place to place and saying, this one is bad and that one is not good, and causing division. This is the rule of the communists when they send individuals into the enemy camp. They said, wait your time, wait your opportunity, and when it comes, let this captain fight that captain. Let this individual see bad about that one. Let them slowly see bad things about each other. Build distrust and make them fight one against another whenever the occasion arises, and be patient. Because they may not fight each other immediately, but simply drop a seed of a lie, drop a seed of a confusion, 
This is what St. Ambrose says when he talks about the crowd. He says, consider the crowd all the way up until Palm Sunday. What do we hear in the gospel? And the people believed in him. And more people followed him. And there were many people, and even to the very end, Caiaphas said, shall the whole nation follow him? Is the whole nation going to go after him? And so on the one side, we see many, many people following Christ. But what is happening at the same time, says St. Ambrose? At the same time, Caiaphas and Annas and the scribes and the Pharisees, they are dropping lies and they are dropping accusations one after another. He cures on the Sabbath. Why did he cure on the Sabbath? He says bad things about the high priest. He is curing again on the Sabbath. He doesn't pay his taxes. This man said that he will raise himself up, that he will just, he will just raise up the temple in three days. It's impossible. He says crazy things. He was the one who they wanted to make king, and he says no. He said you, he, he, he preaches cannibalism. He is not a follower of the law of Moses. They said to the man that was born blind, you follow this man, but we will follow Moses. This man does not follow Moses. He is a Samaritan and half a devil. So many lies, but the people do not believe them. But St. Ambrose tells us, he says, they, later, they don't believe each lie, but after a while, all the lies begin to stick. And yes, they believe in Christ. And at one point in the gospel, as we quote many times, and the people believed in him, but he put not his trust in them because he knew what was in the heart of a man. And they believe in him. Now the multitude of the Jews changes. The multitude changes so that not only are the Pharisees and the Sadducees bad, by the time we arrive at John chapter 8, shortly before the crucifixion, our Lord says to all of the Jews, which of you can convict me of sin? Because they're all scandalized. They got little Jewish blogs of uh, 33 AD. Did you hear this scandal? Did you hear that candle? All that scandal? It's on Jew Info. And they all looked it up, and they all checked it out. And there's one scandal after another, and one scandal after another. One question after another. I'm not saying he's bad, I'm not saying he's evil, but look at this, and look at that, look at the other thing. And there's an unrest that develops amongst the multitudes. And Jesus said to the crowds of the Jews, Which of you will convict me of sin? And if I speak to you the truth, why do you not believe me? They step away from the truth. And they put their confidence in man. Rather than putting the confidence in the truth, they put the confidence in the man. So in the third stage, a very important stage, spreading of gossip, telling people, just stay within the mainstream society. Priests want to join the society, don't join, stay where you are. I support these priests or that priest, but there's no possibility of having a group, no possibility of having a unity, there's nothing that can be done. Just stay where you are. You don't need to become a priest. You don't need to become a sister. You don't need to, to leave the society. You don't need to leave the Nova Sorda. Just stay where you are. Things are not good. Things are not good. I'm part of this resistance, or I'm supposedly part of this resistance, but not really. The third stage. The fourth stage. The fourth stage is the stage just before the explosion. And the fourth stage is, now give the new doctrine. You can't give the new doctrine at the first stage because people will catch you. But when they have unrest, when they are disturbed, when they see chaos, they become upset and they become disturbed and they become confused. Now throw in the new doctrine. This is the stage that we are in right now. This is just before the fifth stage, which is the explosion. Now the fourth stage is to come in and say, yes, I'm still, the new mass is still not good, but it has miracles. It has miracles. So there, you can't deny the facts. Facts are stubborn things, says Bishop Williamson. And the facts are there's miracles. Now the traditional Catholic learns from his mother's milk that, that the new mass is an abomination before God. But in fact, there are miracles. What are we to do? There are miracles. And if you don't believe that this is a miracle, and believe that's a miracle. And so there are miracles in the new Mass. And then also graces flow from this new Mass. I remember in the seminary, Bishop Williamson teaching us, we want to bring modern man back to Catholic culture. We want to bring him back to the understanding and love of beautiful music. But he only knows rock and roll. He only knows modern anti-culture. 
So can you bring him straight back to Beethoven? Can you bring him straight back to the tropes of the Middle Ages? Can you bring him straight back to Mozart? Can you bring him straight back to the great plays of the past? No, no, you cannot. So what do you do? You go to Irish music. And you show them Irish music. And you show them that there's some folk music that's not as bad as modern country and rock. And you take them step by step. This is the method. You cannot bring a soul directly away from Christ. You cannot bring a soul directly into the church of Satan. You must bring him step by step by step. And so the first step is pretend like you're a friend, but never clearly enunciate the same truth. Never clearly advise anything clearly good. Just give an impression of friendship. I am your friend. Can you help me? I would if I could. I'm your friend. How about five bucks? Man, I wish I could help you, but I'm your friend. Where's the five bucks? Any day now, but I'm your friend. And the five bucks never show up, but he's your friend. And so what do you, we, we, we pretend the friendship, we feign the friendship, but no actual helping. The second stage, deaf ear to the call of help, which is that being called but not able to respond. The third stage, spread the gossip. Go from place to place and spread confusion. The fourth stage, open the attack. And in that fourth stage, we say, well, the new mass is not that bad. But in fact, it, it, it's, it's, we're not saying it's good. We're not saying it's bad. And then, of course, the next thing we say is the doctrine. The new church. The new church is different from the Catholic church. But it's not like you think, says Bishop Williamson in the Elias on Commons, Parasite 1, Parasite 2. There are two errors. One error is to think that the new church is so different from the Catholic church that it has nothing of the church in it. The other error is to think that they're so close to one another that we need to be part of the new church and approved by it. Both are wrong. So we're going to throw in our middle doctrine, described by Bishop Tissier in 2012 in one of his letters, described by the Dominicans of Avrier, and quoted here by Father Cardozo, a society priest who was the first to be expelled in 2012, an Argentinian priest, expelled in Brazil back in 2012 for not going along with the modernism of the society. And now he's the first to experience the public condemnation from within the resistance, which should spread patiently to the rest of us as well. But nonetheless, he's the first one to experience it. And here we have, what is it, what is, the, what is this teaching? In Avrier, they say, the conciliar church, the neo-modernist church, is not therefore either a substantially different to the Catholic church, nor absolutely identical to it. It is not substantially different. Now, we learn in philosophy and theology a very simple truth. Substance is one. Substance is undivided. Substance can never be multiplied. You either are or you are not. It's either a dog or it's not a dog. There is no such thing as a mixture of one creature and another. You either are or you are not. This is substance. And what does he say? Well, the two substances partake of each other. Bishop Tissier says, and it's quoted by Avrier, that the substances... It's like, it's like a parasite that eats of the substance of the church, and there is a sharing of the substance. A sharing of the substance. Father Cardozo, in his sermon of February 28th, describing this a little bit, says that, what do they say? And let's continue here. So Luther, is, and then they continue. He was not, one second. Uh... So the Lutheran Church, continuing the Avrier thing, that is the Lutheran Church has mysteriously something Catholic. See, like baptism, they make the comparison. Here they say something that is very true. That, that, that there's, there's baptism in the Lutheran Church, there's baptism in the Catholic Church. So they're partaking of the same substance. No, they are not. No, they are not. The Catholic Church is one and undivided. The other churches are also one and undivided. And they, that now we're having a new teaching. And what does a new teaching do? It creates this confusion in the soul. Well, I'm still against the, the, the modernist church. But you can't say there's nothing Catholic in it. 
in the last four weeks or five weeks, a little bit longer than that, traveling to our resistance chapels, in each place, I'm having to deal with it almost every week. That the Novus Ordo is still bad. It was bad before Bishop Williams had made his three Elias uncommons, or now five Elias uncommons on it. It still is bad. It is a mass of the devil. It is not a mass of God. The new church, the conciliar church, is still another church. Father Bishop Benelli said that to our church of the back in 1975. He says, we have a new church, the conciliar church, and you must follow the church of the council. And our church of says that, no, I do not follow the church of the council. I follow the church founded by Jesus Christ. You follow a church which is Pentecost is on the day of the council. We do not follow that church. Now Bishop Filet says that it's the same church. And they're repeating all over the society, it's the same church. Now what are we doing in the resistance? We're saying, well, it's not exactly the same church, but there are many similarities. Why are we saying that? This is a deception of souls. And it's a grave attack on souls. And this grave attack is causing souls to be confused and to wander away from the truth and to wander away from the faith. No, they are two separate churches. And Father Cardozo in his sermon says, like a tick on my hand. Now the Dominicans say, we must distinguish between the parasite that is the false church, the modernist church, and the individual, the true church upon which it is feeding. But we must not separate them. But you learned in school that when you have a tick on your hand, first thing you do is separate it. Take the tick and remove it from your hand. And don't forget to squash it or flush it down the toilet. But the fact is, you remove the tick and you send the tick to tick hell, not tick heaven. And so why do we do that? We must separate the tick because he's attacking me. Because he is a danger to me, and he is not me. And when we remove the tick, we don't lose a part of ourselves. Now this new teaching is that somehow this bug of modernism, as, as Father Cardozo calls it, this bug of modernism is to be distinguished but not separated. It partakes of the same substance. No, it does not. When the blood is sucked out by the tick, inside of the tick, it's stolen. It's his now. It's not yours anymore. The blood is gone. It is no longer informed by your soul. It is now inside the tick. And he's using it to turn it into a, a fat tick. And it is not good for you anymore. It is no longer your blood. And so likewise, when this false church, the conciliar church, gobbles up souls, and leads them away from God, it is never ever united to the Immaculate Virgin, or the Immaculate Spouse of Christ. And here, Father Cardozo points out in a sermon on February the 28th in Ipachinga, Brazil, points out very correctly, the error of, of, the, of the Bishop Williamson in saying that the new Mass has miracles, and in talking about the error of Avrier and of the, of, the, of the teaching that the new church and the true church are not really separate, and Bishop Williamson repeating that same error in his last liaison comments on the subject, these errors are an attack against the sanctity of the church. There are four marks of the church. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And the holy immaculate spouse. And that is why he says, don't embrace a prostitute and call yourself holy mother church. That's what Father Cardozo says. And these false churches are prostitutes. They are not the true church. We do not turn away from the true church to a false church and claim that it's part of the true church. It is, it is another church founded by Satan. It is not the true church. And souls can be saved only if they fight against it, only if they reject it. One billion souls are walking away from God throughout the church, throughout the world. They are not having children anymore. Homosexuality is spreading widespread throughout the entirety of the earth. And all manner of immorality is spreading. Why? Because they've walked away from the truth. And our Lord Jesus Christ gives the answer in his, as he enters the final battle. If I speak to you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear is that you are not of God. The devil is trying to make us not of God. He's trying to bring us away from God. 
And this strap is now entering into our resistance. Therefore, it must be exposed. And we must explain clearly that we, we stand for the whole truth of the Catholic faith without any admixture with error. We cannot allow the admixture with error. And here we find that our own bishops, Bishop Williamson and Bishop Four, and now the new Bishop Thomas Aquinas, they are saying that the new church does have miracles in the new mass. And the new church is not really that different from the true church, but we still say it's a different thing to a certain extent. And there's good coming out of the Holy Communions in the new mass. And these things are not true. And when souls believe that, they will turn away from the truth. We're already having our own faithful saying, well, I guess I can't talk to my sister about the new mass. Because even though I know it's wrong, she's still getting grace from it. I can't send her anywhere, so I have to be quiet about it. Bishop Williamson said. And so because of the authority of the individual, they are believing the error. Just like within the society, when we saw Bishop Fillet's name at the bottom of a document that said the new mass was legitimately promulgated, we majority of souls accepted it was legitimately promulgated. Just like in the mainstream church, when they saw Paul VI's name at the bottom of a document, of the documents of Vatican II, which says that modernism is now a teaching of the church, and says that all religions are okay, and we must be ecumenical, and you don't have to follow the law of God anymore. Well, the Pope said this is the way it is, so I'm going to follow the Pope. Because the Pope's name was at the bottom of the error, the majority of souls accepted the error. Because Bishop Foulet's name was at the bottom of the error, the majority of souls accepted the error within the Society of St. Pius X. And now because Bishop Foulet's, Bishop Williamson's name was at the bottom of the error, the majority of souls, or many souls, are accepting the errors there as well. But the errors are still errors, no matter who promotes them. And then they mock us, and they say, Well, Father Cardoso, now Father Pfeiffer and the others, where's your bishop? Are you going to get a bishop? How are you going to get a bishop? And so he responds, How is it that I am going to be left without a bishop, says Father Cardozo? Is it perhaps that I am going to be left without St. Augustine? Without, Saint, without a St. Ambrose? Without St. Anthony Mary Claret? Without Bishop John Fisher? Because all of those bishops, thousands and thousands of bishops, and a lot of them saints, have supported and defended the sanctity of the church and the unity of the church. They have not attacked it and have not cast doubts upon it because some people trying to say, save the situation and say they are just saying that it can be possible. They're not saying, Bishop Williamson is not saying there's necessarily miracles in the new mass. He's not necessarily saying the new mass is wonderful and good. It's just saying it might be good and there might be very good coming out of it. And so Father continues, Gentlemen, if I deny a dogma of the faith, or if I put it into doubt, I sin gravely against the faith. Either way. Read your catechism. If I tell you I think that it is possible that there is no hell, I am committing a grave sin against the faith, as grave as if I had told you that there is no hell. So if I tell you there may not be a hell, it's the same evil and the same heresy as saying there is not a hell. Because we know with absolute certainty of faith that there is hell. And therefore, to doubt it or to deny it equals a sin against the faith. So some saying, well, he's not really denying the faith, only saying it's possible. We will not be left without a bishop. And so then, that the, why? Because I cannot cast doubt upon something that's already been defined by the church. Let's see if we understand, says Father Cardoso. Let us see if we are realistic and if we really love the truth. Because it is very nice to say that we love God and viva Christo way, and I don't know what else. But when the situation arises in which we have to decide for the truth, I know we will be, we will be left without a bishop. I was listening to an audio in which someone said, I need a bishop. You know what? I need the faith. If there are any Catholic bishops, blessed be God. If there's no Catholic bishops, I regret it. God, the divine God in the divine providence, will see how to fix this problem. But I, in order to have a bishop, will not compromise an ounce of my faith. I don't know if I have made myself clear. And in our own particular situation, just two weeks ago, we received a note. From Father Thomas Aquinas, the future bishop, be consecrated bishop on March 19th, this Saturday. Father Hugo and Father Pfeiffer, you may not come to the consecration in Brazil. Remember last year we went to the consecration of Bishop Four. 
you may not come to the consecration, to my consecration in Brazil, nor you may also not be received there afterwards at the monastery because of criticizing Bishop Williamson. And the way that it was said to Father Cardozo's people, he went to Sao Paulo to say Mass. And they said, you cannot say Mass here. And they said, what's the problem? And Bishop Father Thomas Aquinas says, you have criticized the hierarchy of the resistance. You have criticized Bishop Williamson by criticizing his statements about the new Mass and so on. Therefore, you cannot say Mass here. And we forget that it is the hallmark of the Catholic tradition and the duty of the Catholic in our times to criticize the hierarchy. We must criticize Pope Francis, who is of greater value than Bishop Williamson. He might be a greater embarrassment, but he is of greater value before God. He is the Holy Father. He has the power of God inside of him, and the church hangs upon Pope Francis. Wherefore, we pray for his conversion. And if Pope Francis converts, then the prophecy of Christ will be fulfilled when he said, Peter, I have prayed for thee, but when thou be converted, strengthen the brethren. And we know that one day it will happen. One day Christ's prophecy will come true. And the Pope will be converted. And perhaps it's Pope Francis. If not him, his successor. But one day the Pope will be converted. And when he is converted, he will strengthen the brethren. And this is infallibly certain. It is a certitude of faith. And they say, you don't have a bishop. God will provide a bishop. Our Lady will provide a bishop. In a few weeks, in a few months' time, the Bishop Williamson is going to come and visit Louisville, Kentucky. He's going to do the confirmations at the Phenei Chapel. He's not going to visit here. He told me last year in New York, I will do confirmations in other places. The last time he agreed to do confirmations for our chapels. But I will not do confirmations anywhere in the New York area. So my people in that area could not receive their confirmations. Because he was going to visit Father April, Father Zendejas' chapel. And when I called the, the, about the Mass in Father Zendejas' chapel the night before, I was told, I am not at liberty to tell you where Mass is tomorrow morning. That morning, 150 people showed up at Mass, but they weren't, I was not at liberty to find out about it. One of our faithful, who lived three houses down in Mayopec, New York, and needed to be conditionally reconfirmed, he was not able to be confirmed because we didn't know. And we were not allowed to be known about the confirmations. And so they're threatening us with sacraments. We will not give you confirmations. We will not ordain your young men to the priesthood. We have seven seminarians here. When will they be ordained? God will provide. There are seven seminarians in Avrier. And they forget that a few months ago in Avrier, on February the 2nd, in the taking of the cassock, what was done? Bishop Williamson tells us a half a dozen priests met in a meeting to hold themselves together in unity of faith. He leaves out in a couple of details, one of which was that the priest who was elected the superior of the USML, the organization that was supposed to meet in Avrier, Father Demarod, was told, you cannot come. Bishop Four said, do not come to this priest meeting. You are not welcome, Father Demarod. He has one of his young men there at the seminary, one of the seven. One of our seminarians from here is there right now. The second one has just arrived. And so they have seven seminarians. And they, 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 Father Demereau, the, the uh, first elected superior, or chosen superior of the USML, not allowed to attend. And he said, what about going to the cassocks? There's one of my guys who's going to receive the cassock. You may not attend. You are not welcome. Then I was told a few days ago, Father, you are exclusive. Remember, the great sin of Father Pfeiffer and Father Hugo is that we are red lighters. I hate the term, but that's what they call us. We say that you should not attend the mainstream society masses, you should not attend the Nova Soto masses, you should not attend the adult masses, because they have changed the faith. But if people come to our mass, like last week, about eight people came to mass, the mass is where I was last week, eight different people came, who came from straight from the Nova Soto. A couple of the ladies came to get the communion in the hand. They said, no communion in the hand. And that they came. And the fact is, that anyone comes to the Novus Ordo, they are not refused to hold a communion. They are not expelled. If they come from the Indult, if they come from the Society of St. Pius X mainstream, if they come from the St. Epicondus chapels, if they come from nowhere, they are not expelled. The cruel and exclusive Father Fiverr and Father Hugo and Father Cardozo and the rest of us, we allow anyone to come to our masses. And yet, 
because we are considered exclusive in that we don't approve. I do not approve of Father Zendayas' Mass. I don't approve of it because he teaches error. But if you go, you go. I tell you, you should not go. If you go, that's up to you. And I will not refuse you Holy Communion, nor will Father Hugo, nor the other priests of us. But we do say the truth. Do not go to those places that compromise the faith. And they said, because you're exclusive and you don't want other priests, or you don't approve of certain other priests, therefore, we will no longer, you can no longer use our candlesticks. You can no longer use our vestments when you come and say Mass in our little chapel. Because we think it's our chapel and not yours. But we may still come to Mass. If they come to Mass, they will not be refused Holy Communion. But as I mentioned, in each chapel, in each place, it is, the, it is the divine law that the priests should run the chapel and not the lay people. It's the divine law. And if a St. Vicondus chapel is, is operating, let the St. Vicondus priest run the chapel. If it's an indult chapel, let the indult priest run the chapel. If it's an independent chapel, let the independent priest run the chapel. This is the divine law and not the laity. But now we find subversion. And where, how is it being promoted? Father Zendayas has gone to the chapel in Connecticut and took away a majority of our people there. Now they're doing an invasion in Pulse Falls. They're doing an invasion in St. Mary's, in St. San Antonio, Texas, and in Philadelphia. They have taken over our chapel there. Some of our people that are still with us are going to Father Tethero's Mass, who's a friend of ours. It's a long drive, but they're going to his Mass so that we can leave there. He's taking care of those people, those two people we have in Philadelphia. So we're not, we're not concerned about them. Father Tethero is taking care of them, one of our friend priests. And so the thing is, so, but now what's happening? We must continue to stand for the truth and continue to stand for the faith. And remember that our battle is a battle of the faith. It's a battle of God versus the words, the religion of God versus the religion of man. And what do they try to do? They try to distract it. Make it a personal battle and cause confusion. And why cause confusion? So that when people see they can't take the mainstream society anymore, they can't take the Novus Ordo anymore, and they can't take the modernism anymore, and more and more of these people exist, they look up what's happening with the resistance.com. You got a bishop saying the new mass is okay. That's crazy. You got all this craziness and all these evil things that are supposed to be happening in Boston, Kentucky. You got all this priest fighting priests. You got a disaster on your hands. I want nothing to do with it. And they do not consider the truth. In the great battle, we must consider the truth. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Blessed is he that is not scandalized in me. We're in the battle of the truth, we're not in the battle of personalities. But on the battle of individuals, as our Bishop Lefebvre said, if I continue to preach the truth, continue to follow me. If I go away from the truth, abandon me. And we will have the victory. The victory is ours. God will provide the bishops. God will provide the sacraments. God will protect us. Even though there have been many casualties in the last year, last six months especially, there have been some casualties. Yet at the same time, we continue to see more souls coming to the tradition. There can be more chapels opening there can be a development amongst the priests. We're going to have a priest meeting in a few weeks. And that we're pulling together the priests once again. There was a dividing, now there must be a coalescing. So you pray for the priests, as we mentioned the other day in the Mass of Sitsienta Saturday, yesterday. We must pray for the priests, and we must persevere in the faith, and our battle must continue as a battle of the faith. And that uh, the, the faith will win. And we should not be discouraged because of these struggles. They happened to our Lord just before his crucifixion. They happened in the foundation of every religious order. They happened in each age of the church. So much so, as Father, Father Michele points out in his book on the Antichrist, he quotes in the first century, the St. Justin Martyr says, this is surely the most wicked time in the history of the world. It's going to end tomorrow. And we go to the second century. This is the most wicked time in the world that's going to end tomorrow. And we go to the 11th century. And St. Bernard says, there has never been a time as wicked as today. No one as wicked as they are today. We come forward to the 14th century and the saints say, there's no one as wicked as today. By the way, they were always right. Because people can always get worse. You may not get better, but you can always get worse. And so the world continues to get worse. And now we say it's never as wicked as it has been today. And it has not as wicked as it has been today. But this is not new. The world has always been wicked. The world has always hated God. And God will always defeat it. And there will always be conversions of souls. And the truth will always have its victory. 
And we must stand firmly upon the truth. And one of the points that Father Cardozo points out at the beginning of his sermon, he says, a man says, fire, fire. And they say, don't talk so loud, it's offensive. <laughs> Do not consider the level of the voice, but go and see if there is a fire. If there is a fire, go. If there's not a fire, condemn the man that said there was a fire. But check to see if there was a fire. You're talking too loud. That's offensive. And so they said of our Lord, he was too negative. He cured at the wrong times. He made bad prudential <coughs> judgments. Our unity is a unity of faith and we follow Christ. And we must have confidence in the victory of Christ. And if we stay firm in the faith, he will provide. And so they mock us. Everyone is going to leave. They are not leaving. God will provide. And our Lord Jesus Christ said, To whom shall we go? Our Lord St. Peter said to our Lord Jesus Christ, To whom shall we go? Thou alone hast the words of eternal life. He said, Will you leave me also? And St. Jerome says, I will preach the truth. And if all leave, I will preach the truth. How did they become martyrs? The martyrs stood for the truth when all abandoned it. Why is Tobias great? Because he stood for the truth when all abandoned it. Why is Daniel such a magnificent prophet? Because he stood for the truth when all were going to send Susanna to innocent death. We must follow the example of Daniel, the example of David, the example of Tobias, the example of our sister Lefebvre. When they said, our sister Lefebvre, you're alone, you're the only bishop. How can you be holding the truth? I am not alone. And it's in the gospel the last couple of days. If we stand for the truth, we are not alone. In the beginning of this gospel, St. John chapter 8, which you read just a few days ago, even if I speak, even if I witness to myself, says the Lord Jesus Christ, I am nonetheless speak the truth. I know my Father, and my Father knows me, and you know not the Father. This is the trouble. How are we going to be faithful in these difficult times? Hear the word of God. How are we going to do that? God must be the center of our lives. Comfort and security is the center of our lives. It must change to God the center of our lives. This cannot be done without the love of our Holy Mother. She is the one that crushes the head of the serpent. She is the one that gets us through this great crisis. We must have the love of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the love of truth. And then she will protect us and make sure that we have the victory. And God will provide bishops. It's easy for him to provide. He invented the sacrament. He knows how to provide bishops. He will provide. He will make sure that we never are left abandoned. Already this very weekend, two cases. This weekend, as in the last two days, one lady who is not even part of the resistance, but her sister is. She's dying and needs anointing. Father, can you anoint? She just happens to be in Chicago. So south, I do the anointing. On the same day, Saturday, there was another woman who used to go to our Mass in another chapel, but because of her husband, and because she wanted to make sure that her husband got buried, and she was afraid that maybe there wouldn't be a Catholic burial, now can Father come? She went back to the Nova Shortle. Her husband died and was buried on Saturday, the same day, or Friday, a couple days, not on Saturday, but a few days Friday. The Nova Shortle priest refused to do the burial. Didn't receive another sort of funeral like she thought she would. Because she'd stopped going to Mass, they didn't call me. It didn't matter that she stopped going. If she had called me or called Father Hugo, we would have been there doing the funeral. But they were looking for security. Security in the Nova Sordo. And there were no funerals. Also speaking to others, they say there are many now being buried without funerals, even Nova Sordo funerals. The priest won't do the funeral. The family doesn't want to bother with the ceremony. And so they go straight to the ground they go to straight to the graveyard and throw the body in the ground. And so here we are. One soul receives the anointing two days ago because her sister is with the resistance. Three years since the last time to have the sacraments. Even Nova Sordo. Three years. But because a sister is in the resistance, a young 90-year-old lady. And so she receives the sacraments. Another one who was in the resistance was stepped away because of the insecurity. No burial. 
Seminarians leave, so they're going to be certainly ordained. Will they be ordained? Do you really know what is tomorrow? God will provide. Things may not work out like you expect. But stand for the truth. Stay with the truth. God will provide. And we find so many times already in the last 20 years, 22 years, whatever it is, the priesthood, the truth of what Father Cummins said in Australia many years ago. When an old young Nova Soto priest in the 1970s said, see that old lady? She's going to die without the sacraments. She's going to die without burial because Father Cummins comes from 2,000 miles away. What are you going to do when you die? And the lady for aid said to Father Cummins, Father, what are you going to do? What am I going to do when I die? And he simply responded, my experience has been that whenever I'm needed, I'm not very far away. You see, this weekend, we weren't supposed to fly to Chicago. We were supposed to fly to Green Bay and to Minneapolis. But the tickets were too expensive. So as a result, Father Hugo and I both fly to Chicago. Before we get on the plane to Chicago, we find out that someone's dying in Chicago. And so we must anoint someone in Chicago. <laughs> then I'm able to get another flight from Midway. She was near the Midway airport. And be able to make it to Mass it, it, actually, earlier than I would have been if I drove there, which was my battle plan, to drive the eight-hour drive from Chicago there. Did the anointing. Found a cheap ticket that didn't exist the day before. Flew to, the, to Minneapolis and got to, we had Mass at 8 o'clock at night, but it would have been 9 or 10 if I had been driving there. God will provide our schedules. We notice many times, sometimes you can smell it. You know, a plane is delayed, and the, there's something going wrong in the airport, and you just, something's going to happen. <laughs> sometimes you can smell it. And sure enough, that is the time. And the, God will provide. God will take care of things. We only need to have the faith. And our battle is a battle of faith. And I will not. If I want to have the young men ordained, all I have to do is stop criticizing Bishop Fillet and crop criticizing Bishop Williamson. That's all I have to do. I just have to stop preaching the truth. I just have to stop condemning the errors. And everything will be wonderful, will it? Whenever you follow the devil, somehow things turn out bad anyway. Turns out he's not as honest and a good guy as they say he is. And things don't work out that well when you follow the devil. Turns out he's pretty devilish. Turns out he's pretty demonic. Turns out things don't work out like you expect. <coughs> Therefore, stand for the truth and let God and that providence fill in the gaps. And they will. God will. The Blessed Virgin will. So it shall be. We must have faith. And the victory will come if we stay close to the faith. And pray for the priests who will be meeting in the next few weeks. Some of the priests have suffered very much. Many have been persecuted. Now there's a great persecution of the priests is continuing. But we must hold together. Hold the priests together. Stand together for the truth and for the faith. And then God will give us the victory. And this is what's going to happen. And ask the Blessed Virgin to protect us and to protect the faith. And we must stand firm and keep, keep in the big picture that we are here for Christ. We are not here for anything else. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.